I'm Richard Carmona, Surgeon General of the United States. All of us want to live long, healthy, independent lives, but to do this, we must take an active role in our health. One of the easiest ways we can prevent illness is by having the flu and pneumonia immunizations. They can cut your risk of getting the flu in half, and they're covered by Medicare. It is important for you to consult with a personal physician about getting immunized each year for the flu, and only once after age 65 for pneumonia. It is important to be immunized against the flu every year because every year we see new and different strains of the flu virus. It is also important to get your immunizations early since it takes about two weeks for the vaccines to go to work in your system. And remember that in the unlikely instance that you do get the flu or pneumonia, if you are immunized, your illness will not be as severe. Let me also emphasize that if you've had a bad experience with the flu shot in the past, you need to know that today's shots have been greatly improved and side effects are very rare. As your Surgeon General, I can assure you that the risks and benefits of these immunizations have been thoroughly investigated. They are as safe as can be. We sometimes forget how horrific deadly diseases like the flu and pneumonia can be. But just as recently as the closing years of World War I, almost half the world came down with the flu and 20 million people died. 700,000 of them were right here in the United States. The documentary you're about to watch called Standing in the Safety Zone tells the story of what happened in just one American city, Baltimore, Maryland. The story is told from the viewpoint of the African American community. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, which manages Medicare, picked this particular story because traditionally it has been the African American seniors that are the least prepared to fight the flu. So stay tuned because at the end of the program we are going to give you information on how to fight the flu. I'm June Thorne. Most people know us for running the Medicare and Medicaid programs. Baltimore has been home for our national headquarters since the 1970s, and we have developed deep roots in this community. When we learned that thousands of Baltimore seniors suffer needlessly from the flu and pneumonia every year, we went to work to make a difference. We talked to our friends, families, and neighbors, and found that we had a lot to learn about the cost of the flu to an unprepared community. We've asked Emmy Award-winning actor Andre Brower to help us learn more about the biggest flu epidemic in history, the Spanish flu of 1918. We spoke with some survivors of that awful time and heard some sobering stories. We also visited one of Baltimore's leading cardiologists to learn how we and our families can make a difference every year. We'll begin our story by looking back through the years and remembering what life was like in Baltimore in 1918. While over a million U.S. troops were in Europe, Fighting the Germans, new opportunities opened up for African Americans and women working in the factories and running the farms. Cities like Baltimore were growing, but they were completely unprepared for an epidemic like the Spanish flu. For many years, the survivors who fought the flu were the forgotten heroes of 1918. Andre Brower is here to help us look back and to introduce some of those heroes. Hello, I'm Andre Brower. I've come to know the city and people of Baltimore over a number of years, but I've never heard stories quite like the ones we're going to hear today. The influenza epidemic of 1918 was called the Spanish flu, and it made millions sick and killed almost 700,000 Americans. That's more than World War I and II, the Korean War and Vietnam combined. It's hard to imagine. 
in one awful epidemic lasting only a few months, the average age of Americans was lowered by 13 years. The magnitude and impact of 1918 on the African American community was especially tough. Miss Rachel here is a survivor of that epidemic. In 1918, I lived in Baltimore, Maryland. When I was a little girl, I had the flu, and my mother took care of me because they were going to send me away, but she said, I'll take care of her. Baltimore was very busy. Hopkins at that time was just a red brick building. And most of us black people lived in smaller streets. Everybody was neighborly. Nineteen eighteen is very vivid to me because I remember that see I was in kindergarten and we had been a part of the buying liberty stamps and so forth and we, uh, the armistice came in that year too. And when the armistice happened, of course, you know, it was just all, everybody was blowing horns and, and jumping around and making noise. In the early days, it was a different Baltimore altogether. I remember the, when the armistice was signed and the people were in the street shouting and all that and uh, marching in the streets and all, but I didn't, I didn't march. I was glad to get back to normal. The war ended in Europe, but America would not get back to normal. The fall of 1918 saw the fiercest battle in the struggle against a tiny silent killer, influenza. I'm Dr. Peter Bielenson, Health Commissioner for the City of Baltimore. Baltimore's African American community was hit hard during the influenza epidemic of 1918. It passed from soldiers to civilians, children to parents, family to family, neighborhood to neighborhood. Hardly a home was unaffected. The epidemic of 1918 brought the city to a standstill. 30,000 students and 200 teachers became sick, closing down the city schools. Police and fire departments were struck down. Mothers and fathers were too sick to work. During the early days of the epidemic, Baltimore's leaders hesitated and it cost lives. In 1918, there were no flu shots, so when Baltimore failed to close businesses and theaters and cancel public meetings, the flu spread out of control. I don't know why, but I didn't have the flu. Two people who stayed in the dormitory where I was uh, died on the floor where I lived, but I don't remember being too disturbed about it. Maybe I didn't have sense enough. Well, as I understand it, the doctors, I suppose, in treating the, the patients, put signs on the doors of, of the people who had the flu. They had signs all over the streets on people's doors. So it must have been pretty bad. Well, as my mother would call to town, see, my aunt and my grandmother lived together. But somehow or other, my grandmother wasn't affected, as I can recall. But my aunt was very, very sick, and my mother would go well, the store I was almost, up between, I guess, about 12 miles or so where she had to go to the telephone. But she went every day to call to see how her sister was. And she was pretty bad off. We thought she would die. But she came out of it. I don't know exactly how long she was sick, but, but she came out of it. Well, no, I don't think anybody could ever forget about the flu, the way people were dying, you see. I grew up there in Sparrow's Point. They had a shipyard there. And the steel mill, all the steel that goes into whatever you need steel for, the steel mills were there. Stuff of steel went around and got all these men from down south to, uh, to operate the mills, you know. Just didn't think they had the flu. In a couple of days, they did. When we had the flu in 1918, my family, it was about four of us really, really down with it. We had two doctors there would come and 
try to break the temperature, tried to get a pulse, a heartbeat, and they couldn't get it, and they just thought I had passed. But they put this Jaeger Slenemy to my nose, and I started kicking my mother say, and they knew I was still living. We made it by the help of the Lord. My mother began to get ill. We did not have a telephone as yet, because this was a crisis that made us get one. And she was called by long distance on a drugstore phone about relatives in a town 30 miles from us, see if she could come there to help out. And by the time she came back, I was vomiting and very ill. And my father was in Chicago at a meeting, and he couldn't get back till the next day. Then when he got back, the doctor said to him, your wife is, very, is ill, but your daughter is critical. And I had developed double pneumonia. And they had to take me to the hospital. And at the time, the way they were treating it, they had all the windows open and had just blankets and blankets over me. Thanksgiving was always a very big meal with us and everything, but I, I don't even remember it. And tell you the truth, I don't really remember. I know we had Christmas, but I don't really remember Christmas because you see, it was uh, pretty soon after that. So altogether, seven of us had the flu. My father wouldn't go to bed. He was able to get his clothes on, so he just sat up. He sat up with the flu. <laughs> and uh, uh, my mother didn't go to bed, but she, I remember she got Christmas dinner, and she was too sick to eat a mouthful of it. During that particular time, it was just popular to have the flu. Just as today, Everyone had an opinion about how to fight the flu. On October 17, 1918, the Baltimore Sun reported the story of the Chesapeake Roofing and Pipe Covering Company where a different kind of flu shot was being dispensed. On the advice of his family physician, the company's president dispensed the very best Maryland rye whiskey to his men as often as each worker felt necessary to prevent the flu. No surprise when a day later, 500 men showed up looking for work and whiskey. Today, we know that alcohol cannot prevent the flu, but whiskey was just one of many things folks use to prevent or fight the flu. We had a, a dispensary, and they would give you every, all the medicine was the same. It was called Brown's Mixture in a bottle, and I don't care what you had, that's what you got. And then you'd have a little can, little brass type of can with a little white label, and that was a salve. And that's the two things you got at the dispensary all the time. There wasn't lots of medicines, and I got the flu, and it was just my mother and I. She went to the drugstore, which was at the corner, and she went there and she got, it was like a vest, it was red flannel, and she'd put that on my chest and over my back. And then she would grease me with, I think it was, uh, we used to call it mutton tallow. I don't hear it now, but that's what most people in those days grease with mutton tallow. And then she would put it in a little bag, she'd sew some asphetity. It was very smelly, and she'd put that on my back. And that's what I wore the entire cold day, winter days. Two of my friends, we went to school together, and both of them were stricken with the flu. And I would go out to then, used to call it Bayview Hospital, and we'd walk out there. Because we didn't have any car fare, so we would walk to go visit her. And they'd put her out on a porch in the cold winter time, and they had blankets, blankets, and a hood on, and that's where, but she died. Both of them died. I do remember a friend of mine, her father died with the flu, and I just felt so sorry for her. We went to school together down in the grades. And uh, she was crying and I was crying because her father died. A great deal of the guesswork for treatment has now been replaced by good medical research. Flu symptoms can differ from person to person, but usually a sudden rise in temperature, a cough, 
headache, aching muscles, chills, and red watery eyes are most common. As for treating the aches and pains, your doctor will know what is best for you. Let me introduce you uh, to a friend of mine. This is uh, Dr. Saunders. Uh, hi, you. Who's a cardiologist and the um, chief, chief of hypertension at the University of Maryland. Doctor, I have a question for you. Should I take the flu shot at my age, 95? Uh, absolutely, Miss Rachel. You should take the flu shot, even at your age. And you said it'd be all right for me? It'd be all right for you. It's very safe. Uh, the risk of having any problem from the flu shot itself uh, is very, very small. How expensive is it? Uh, actually, most doctors give the flu shot free uh, to Medicare patients. They don't even charge for it. It's just a matter of a quick stick in the arm, and that's it. So, what so about enjoy. people with diabetes? I'm a diabetic, and I have angina. Having diabetes and angina, you are exactly the kind of person that should get it because these are, those are chronic diseases which tend to make your body a little bit more susceptible uh, to the disease. And if you get the flu, you are much more likely to get a complication like a pneumonia. Now, as Ms. Rachel was telling us earlier about the, the 1918 uh, uh, epidemic, the Spanish flu, we were unprepared in 1918. Are we uh, better prepared today to combat the flu? We've learned from those experiences, and so we are prepared by having these vaccines available. But people have to take the vaccine. Mm -hmm. And you yourself get the flu shot every fall? I take the flu shot every fall. Thank you very much, Dr. Saunders. I appreciate uh, answering all our questions. You're perfectly welcome. How anyone survived the epidemic of 1918 is a miracle. In those days, segregation went by the name of Jim Crow and kept even the sickest African Americans out of all but a few hospitals. Over the last 80 years, we have made great progress. With the 1965 enactment of Medicare and Medicaid, we have a formula for success for the elderly. Here in Baltimore, along with the help of Morgan State University, we have listened to and we have learned from the survivors of the Spanish flu. Recently, some survivors gathered together at Morgan State University to celebrate their victory over the flu of 1918. Sure sounds like a long time ago. But as you've seen today, the survivors of that terrible epidemic remember that year. And they know what they need to do to make sure it doesn't happen again. I've suggested it to all my family, and I have all of them taking flu shots. I get the flu shot every year. The doctors recommended it. So why have a doctor if you don't accept his recommendations? By all means, take your flu shot.
please get your flu shot and not the flu. Do it to protect not only yourself, but also the ones you love. It doesn't take much time, and best of all, after you do, you'll be standing in the safety zone. Thanks for listening to our story. And thank you, Andre, for all your help. The Surgeon General promised we would be back with information to fight the flu and help you protect yourself and your family. Take our short flu quiz and see if you're standing in the safety zone. What's the easiest way to prevent flu and pneumonia? A. Wash your hands eight times a day. B. Avoid contact with children. C. Get your flu and pneumonia shots. The answer? While A and B may help some, the most reliable way to fight the flu is with the modern flu shot. Which of these does not happen when you get a flu shot? A. Your protection builds over a two-week period. B. You cut your risk of hospitalization or death from flu or pneumonia in half. Or C. You get the flu. The answer, of course, is C. Modern flu shots cannot give you the flu. And finally, what does a flu shot cost a Medicare beneficiary? The answer? If your doctor is a participating Medicare physician, your flu shot and your pneumonia shot are free. So how would you do? If you miss any of our questions, see your doctor or visit www.medicare.gov. It makes good sense to prevent illness from the flu by getting vaccinated each year. Remember the flu is a serious threat to all of us and no one can predict when another killer flu will strike. So call your doctor now about getting your flu and pneumonia immunizations. Make sure that you are not a candidate for the flu this holiday season.